Oh, all right. So um, then I think we should slowly get started. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, the second uh, uh, happening of our Comoral uh, uh, seminar series. I'm uh, Frans Oliuk, and we're organizing this uh, with Carl. You want to wave, Carl? Or Shaigan, and Marta, and Chris. And today, uh, our speaker uh, is Greg Boutelier. Let me uh, first uh, attend you on uh, a couple of practicalities. Um, so the uh, uh, outline of this meeting is uh, going to be uh, 50 minutes of talk, and then uh, we'll leave, uh, hopefully, about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, please mute yourselves uh, such that uh, we can all hear the talk well. Um, if you want to ask questions, please type them in the chat, uh, uh, in the sidebar. Um, if you have a clarification question, uh, try to indicate that, then we can uh, try and bring it to uh, Greg's attention, such that uh, well, we can all follow on what's going on in the talk. Um, let me see, slides will be uh, hopefully available uh, on the websites afterwards. And uh, also important to note that this session will also be streamed on YouTube. So if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please, uh, in addition to your microphone, also turn off your video. All right, well, hope uh, all that is clear. Then uh, let's get to the main act. Uh, so today we have Craig Putelier. He's a principal scientist uh, at Google. Uh, and I think he's also one of the, the, the persons that needs little introduction. Um, he has made uh, many uh, key contributions to uh, fields of, of decision-making under uncertainty, MDPs, uh, preference elicitation, user modeling, modeling recommender systems, uh, mechanism design, and certainly also reinforcement learning and multi-agent reinforcement learning. I, uh, I would imagine that uh, many people are familiar with uh, his paper uh, with Caroline Klaus and uh, AAAI 1998 uh, that demonstrates convergence of individual queue learners in cooperative multi-agent systems. And for me personally, um, one of his papers, uh, Decision Theoretic Planning, uh, published in uh, JIR 99, uh, yeah, that really changed my, uh, my life. Uh, and let me on a path to explore uh, structure and exploiting factorization uh, in a reinforcement learning type of settings. All right, uh, of course, uh, there's a very long list of academic servers, honors, uh, awards. I'm not going to mention everything. Let me perhaps highlight a couple of things. Uh, Greg served as a program chair for HKI and UAI. He was the editor in chief of uh, JIRE, the Journal of AI Research. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada uh, and the ACM and AAAI. And he's a recipient of uh, many other prizes, uh, uh, among which Ichikai Jair Best Paper Prize, an AIJ Prominent Paper Award, and he also received the 2018 ACM SIGI Autonomous Agent Research Award. All right, um, yeah. Enough said. I'm very happy that uh, Greg is here today and agreed to give this talk. Um, I understand that welcoming him is a bit difficult, so I hope everybody will allow me uh, uh, to do it uh, on your behalf. So, Greg, welcome, uh, and the floor is yours. Yeah, great. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for a very gracious int introduction that makes me feel a little old. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and again, I want to want to thank you guys for organizing this series. Um, you know, I personally was definitely disappointed when the spring symposium got canceled, uh, you know, for obvious reasons uh, last uh, last March, because I was really looking forward to chatting with this group of people uh, about how we might bring together reinforcement learning, uh, multi-agent reasoning about multi-agent systems and bring them to bear on recommender systems. Um, I, I know this won't serve as a, as a substitute for that, but, but again, I'm happy to, to engage in a lot of discussion, even be interrupted with, with questions if, uh, if, if that's what's required to, to generate a little bit of interaction. So anyway, thanks, thanks Franz and, and the, all the organizers for putting this series together. So, um, so for those of you, probably some of you, uh, uh, 
uh, know me and are familiar with my research, um, you, you've probably noticed that over the last uh, several years, my attention has learned, turned more or less towards recommender systems. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is you just this, the kind of the prevalence and ubiquity of recommender systems in our daily lives means that I think if we as the, the practitioners, uh, the purveyors of recommender systems, but just as importantly, we in the research community, if we can kind of get it right, then we have a tremendous opportunity, I think, to improve the lives of individual users. But I think more importantly, there's a there's a chance to have pretty tremendous societal impact. I hope the title of my talk makes that clear. And that's one of the themes that I want to get across uh, in this talk today. Um, the second reason is that it's an area that has allowed me to start to tie together three different themes in my own uh, from my own personal research interests, tie them together in pretty inextric inextricable ways. And that, those are um, kind of preference modeling and personalized decision support. The second is sequential reasoning and reinforcement learning. And the third is economic modeling, multi-agent modeling, mechanism design. And I think there's a pretty interesting opportunity to start to bring these things together if we want to do a better job in having recommender systems do what's best for our users. So, um, so just by just to uh, by way of outline, I'm going to kick off the talk with a little bit of kind of informal stage setting. It's almost, almost going to be non-technical framing of some of the challenges that I think we need to address as a research community if we want to get recommender systems right in some sense. Uh, and I'm going to frame this around this, the, uh, what seems to be a relatively simple question. What does it mean to act in the user's best interest? I wanna to try to convince you that I don't think we really have a handle on that within the recommender systems community so far. I'm hoping that this non-technical framing of, of some of these challenges will set the stage then for uh, some of the technical parts of the talk. One of the things that we'll see is for this, this crowd, it's gonna be pretty obvious that if you wanna act in the user's best interest, you have to think about long-term optimization and reinforcement learning. So we'll take a bit of a detour and talk about some work we've been doing on the application of reinforcement learning to recommender systems. We'll talk about one specific problem, that of slate optimization. But I'll conclude with just, a, a, again, a few challenges that I think we need to address as a, as a community in applying RL to recommender systems. And then finally, uh, I'll, I'll turn my attention to the issue of multi-agent interaction and ecosystem effects within recommender systems. This is something that's gotten surprisingly little attention. And what I want to try to do is convince you that if you ignore those things, it's going to negatively impact your ability to engage in long-term optimization to actually act in a user's best interest over the long run. So I'll talk about some work that we've been doing trying to optimize for the long run equilibria of these what are complex multi-agent dynamical systems and try to optimize user social uh, user social welfare in that, in uh, that context. And finally, I'll conclude, depending on how time goes, with just a few thoughts on what I think are some really interesting challenges in trying to bring uh, kind of a multi-agent, essentially a market or mechanism design perspective to the problem of recommender systems. So that'll just be a little open-ended speculation. I hope that generates a little bit of discussion if we have time at the end. All right, so to kick things off, I just, you know, I'm gonna start with a very obvious observation, basically that recommender systems uh, are at the center of and are mediating increasing amounts of our daily activity, whether it's our quest for information, our consumption of content, our purchases of, 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 of goods and services, even our interactions with, with each other. Recommender systems are often at the heart of that these days. Um, and because of that, the recommender systems have the potential to, to shape user behavior in a way greater than ever, uh, ever before. Uh, for me, that means that both the purveyors and practitioners of recommenders and those of us in the research community think it's incumbent upon us to think about designing what I like to call user-centric recommenders, uh, recommender systems that act in a user's best interest. Uh, and and we'll, get, we'll get into what that exactly means in just a minute. Uh, but we have made some progress over maybe the last six to eight years, in particular, recommenders have moved beyond what I call the, the lather, rinse, repeat model, that traditional recommender system model where the recommender puts an item in front of a user, we observe, it observes the response, did you click, how long did you watch, how much did you read, did you like or dislike, updates its model of the user and then repeats, puts another in, right, item in front of the user, another item and, and so on. 
And we've moved beyond that over the last, say, half dozen years, maybe six to eight years. We're increasingly using very rich machine learned models to predict user intent, to predict their preferences, their interests and their needs with, with a little greater precision. Uh, we've got tremendous improvements in speech understanding, natural language and dialogue technologies, which I, I view as improving the communication bandwidth between the user and, and the recommender that allows users to a little more directly and efficiently specify exactly what their needs or their preferences are. But of course, huge challenges re, uh, remain if we really want to get this way. And so I want to start with a really simple question, right? What does it mean to act in a user's best interest? So I'm going to give maybe a, a little bit of kind of non-technical framing of of the challenges associated with this. While it seems like a simple question, I'm gonna argue that it's surprisingly non-trivial, uh, subtle, and something that we really haven't wrapped our, head, wrapped our heads around. So in principle, it seems simple, right? Conceptually, we need to understand a user's preferences or their utility function, and given the space of recommendations, we wanna recommend the thing that maximizes user utility. But there are a bunch of, there are a bunch of bunch of issues that arise that we really haven't dealt with, that I think, again, require a reframing of how we think about recommender systems. And it all revolves around how we define the outcome space, right? So what do we mean by the, by the outcome space? Well, traditionally in recommenders, we tend to equate outcomes with the items that we're recommending. So the recommender will take a bunch of potential content items or products. It will score them based to generate a prediction of how much they think the user will like or the probability of click, maybe conditioned on some query or context, and then put the, the highest scoring item or maybe the top K scoring items in front of that user. But this can be incredibly limiting, equated, the idea of equating outcomes with items for a variety of different reasons. And let me talk about just a, a, a couple of these. Right? The first is the fact that items are often used to facilitate other outcomes by the user. I'm really drawn to this distinction that Keeney made a while ago between means objectives and ends objectives. Recommenders are typically basing their recommendations on features of the items what, that they're recommending, while users are actually deriving value from the usage of those items that is facilitated by the, by the item feature. So for example, if we're helping a user navigate the, you know, the purchase of a new camera, the recommender will often focus on various technical features and price and so on of, of the camera itself. But ultimately, the value that the user derives from the camera may depend on whether they want to take nature photographs, family vacation photos, or if it's really intended to get those great action shots of their kids on their, on their sports teams. Uh, if we're thinking about recipe recommendation, you know, the, the ingredients and you know, your affinity for that recipe may have, a, have an impact on, on uh, whether or not it's a good recommendation. But it may also be that you know, this week I'm trying to get my kids to eat more vegetables, right? So the outcome facilitated by that recommendation really matters. In order to do this kind of thing, we really have to change how we conceive of the outcome within a recommender system. Uh, another another factor is uh, that 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 requires we rethink outcomes is the role of exogenous factors. In particular, the utility that the user derives from a recommended item is often influenced by exogenous factors that are beyond the control of the user and uh, beyond the control of the recommender system and even beyond the control of the user. So, for example, for making a restaurant recommendation, especially here in San Francisco. Um, the whether restaurant A or restaurant B is a better recommendation depends on how much you like the restaurant, but it may also be impacted by the availability of parking uh, if, if you're planning to drive there. I've lost more than a few restaurant reservations by not being able to find parking in the last several years. Uh, whether or not restaurant A or restaurant B is, is better for a specific user in a particular context may depend on whether you have theater tickets and is this restaurant known for you know, slow service and long waiting times? That may impact the recommendation. Uh, notice that factors like this are characterized by inherent uncertainty. So that's gonna require that we assess the risk of the recommendation and helping the user ultimately achieve the outcome of having a, a pleasant evening out, for example. Um, it may require that we compute the expected utility over the space of possible outcomes that the item facilitates. Again, requires that we rethink what we mean by outcomes in a recommender. And finally, and I could go on and on, there are many other things that we, we could imagine, but the last one I'll point out is the fact that user utility 
is often not a simple function of the individual items that are being consumed, but it often depends in complex ways on a consumption stream. So if you think about uh, uh, watching a, a sequence of videos, maybe to, to end your evening, for me, I want to start with kind of the hardcore kind of depressing news that, you know, that we seem to have too much of these days, then maybe move on to business news and then wrap up with some lighter fare, maybe some comedy, some music and so on. So the temporal pattern of consumption may actually matter. Uh, other properties such as the diversity or uniformity of a music playlist, the degree of novelty or familiarity of the items that make up the consumption stream, all of these may, may impact user utility. The streams that we're talking about, they could be at the session level, could be over just multiple days or weeks, or could even be a lifetime of thinking about maybe education or self-improvement. Uh, again, the, the key thing is we really have to rethink what we're counting as an outcome in the recommender system in order to do that. Okay. Uh, the minute we complexify, if I, to, to, to use an awkward term, the, this notion of outcome, it immediately complicates how we should be thinking about user preferences. Preferences are gonna be inherently combinatorial because of feature interactions or because of the bundles or consumption streams that we have to, that we have to aggregate. The user preferences are gonna be contextual and conditional. It will depend on, you know, a good, a good restaurant recommendation depends on who you're going out with uh, and what time of day you wanna go. We're gonna to have to quantify our, these preferences in the form of perhaps utility functions if we want to assess risk associated with these outcomes. Uh, and there's much more that we can talk about in terms of complexity of preferences. You know, I, I won't get into it, but we have to think about transient versus persistent preferences, uh, preferences that a user may have for different interaction modes. Do they want to engage with the recommender via voice, via keyboard, via touchscreen? Do, do they want to do things multimodally? Do they have preferences for different communication styles? Uh, do different forms of interaction impose greater or lesser cognitive burdens on different types of users? Things along those lines. The things along those lines. All of those things ultimately will have to get right. Finally, the minute we think about complex preferences in this way, we recognize that the way that traditional recommender systems assess user preferences to the extent that they do is very, very limited. Again, if you think about that lather, rinse, repeat model, recommenders are generally just looking at what, how did the user respond to a particular item and, and trying to interpret preferences, uh, assess the user's preferences that way. And this is an incredibly single bit of information is an incredibly weak signal, has very low signal to noise ratio. Where we're talking about trying to identify the complex and evolving preferences that we've, that we've just, uh, that we just talked about. And I would love to go on and on about this and happy to talk about it in, in, in discussion if we have some time. But I think we, we really need to focus our attention on richer interfaces, improve language and dialogue technologies, again, to continue to improve the bandwidth of communication that we have with users. But from a research perspective, I think there's tremendous scope for improving our identification techniques, whether it's preference elicitation methods to handle these types of complex preference models, exploration techniques of the bandit style that, again, are sensitive to, to uh, you know, to, to these complex, com uh, complex um, uh, context and conditional types of preferences. Uh, again, better language and dialect technologies and, and things along those lines. So very non-technical. I just want to throw that out there for, for us uh, because I do think there are a lot of really interesting research opportunities and challenges that we're, we're going to have to get right. Um, but now let, let me turn attention to some more precise questions. So let's focus on the optimization question. What does it mean to act in a user's best interest? Well, based on everything that I just said, it should be pretty clear that in many cases, optimizing a user's utility is going to require some form of planning over an extended horizon which you know, I don't have to convince this group of, of course, right? If we think about optimizing over a consumption stream, for example, we probably have to plan the sequence of, of, of items that we're going to recommend and respond dynamically to how users uh, re react to those. Uh, or if you think about the multi-term interaction that's required to uncover a user's goals, preferences, the trade-offs that they're prepared to make uh, to try to assess the risk of various outcomes and things along those lines. Obviously, 
that would suggest the use of reinforcement learning. And, and again, for this crowd, I don't have to spend a lot of time motivating the use of reinforcement learning. We're all familiar with the tremendous successes that we've seen in application in areas and domains of application like game playing, robotics, the control of physical systems and things of that nature. But I would argue we've seen far fewer wins in user facing applications like advertising systems, since I work at Google, uh, recommender systems and things of things of that nature. And there's some reasons for that. I, I'll, at, at the end of this section, I'll say just a few words about some of the really hard challenges that emerge when we try to apply RL to recommender systems. But I want to talk about just one very specific challenge. That was some work that we did uh, uh, last year. Well, I guess it's 2021, so two years ago uh, at HCI 19. Um, and this was dealing with the problem of slate recommendations. So even though we talked about recommenders putting items in front of users to see how they respond, most modern recommender systems don't do that. They usually collect up some recommended items in subsets or slates that they put in front of the user. A number of reasons for that, probably the most obvious one is that in any given moment, we're not actually very sure of the actual intent of the user. So putting a slate of items in front of the user allows us to kind of cover the modes of our uncertainty possibly implicitly. So here, what I'm showing is just, um, where's my there, laser pointer here? Uh, just you, the YouTube homepage in the, on, uh, on a mobile device, what it looks like on a desktop. And we see that the, these videos are packaged up in slates. And why is this gonna be challenging for reinforcement learning? Well, these slates are going to introduce some combinatorics into the action space that can be really hard to manage, okay? So, so how, do we, how would we formalize this problem? Just it's a kind of an informal level. We wanna have a, an RL and DP formulation. Uh, let's suppose that our objective is to say, take a particular, maybe a user session uh, with a recommender, and maybe we wanna maximize cumulative user engagement with the recommended items over the course of that session, where I'm being intentionally vague about what we mean by user engagement, can be the number of items consumed, how much the user liked the items, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it's really not critical what that engagement signal is. How we formulate this problem is, well, we'd have a state space that cap that reflects various user features, some summarization of user history, maybe various contextual and environmental features. We'd have a reward function, that would, that would be associated with the immediate engagement with an item that the, that the user just uh, uh, consumed or selected from the slate of, uh, slate of recommendations, for instance, which video did they watch, how much did they like it, how much did they engage with it, or what have you. And then our action space, of course, is not going to be the individual items, but rather it's gonna be the recommended slates, because at, at, at every interaction, every event, we have to decide on a slate of items to put in front of the user. And this obviously is going to generate. Oops, what? Uh oh. Uh, my slides are stalled, everybody. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. No problem. Take your time. Oh. Huh. Oops. The, the slides are literally stalled. Do you want to try on uh, on sharing your screen and sharing again? Uh, you, you know what? I think uh, I think it's my remote keyboard. Okay, I'll I'll just okay. Uh, sorry about that. No um, problem. So okay, uh, it's going to be hard to do the laser pointer. Okay. Anyway, sorry about that. So um, so this this. The, the, the fact that the action space is a, set of, is a set of slates is going to be challenging, right? Because we now have a combinatorial, basically a factorial number of possible actions that we can take at every point in time. We have n, n items that we can choose from, k items that we can put on the slate. We get this, this, this horrible explosion. And this is going to be problematic for a number of reasons. From a learning perspective, it'll be problematic for generalization and exploration because we really want to generalize uh, over the over the action space, it's going to be problematic for optimization, where we're trying to find the best action to take at any time. Now, the way people tend to think about this problem, but usually in kind of an ad hoc heuristic way, is to try to decompose the value of a slate into some function of the value of its constituent items. Uh, but there's a problem with that, probably at least with a lot of the traditional methods that people use, and that's the issue of item interaction. 
In particular, the presence of SIM items on the slate is going to impact how a user responds to other items on the slate, hence will impact our estimate of the long-term value of the image. So for example, if I'm presented with a John Oliver video and a slate of other, say, political satire videos, my, my odds of clicking on that video are probably different than if it's presented on a slate of funny cat videos, right? And I'll let you, it'll let you make your own assessment as, as to in which condition I'm more or less likely to click. So it basically means that the value of a slate depends on a user choice model, some model that tells us what is the probability that a user will select an item in the presence of all of the other items on the slate. The variety of choice models that get used in, in econometrics and statistics and learning to rank, uh, for instance, Plackett Loose. Here I'm just showing uh, a, a simple what's known as multinomial logit or a loose shepherd model where every item has some maybe inherent attractiveness or value to the user and the probability of clicking is proportional to the exponentiated value uh, uh, of that item. The key point though is that it requires joint optimization of the slate if we want if, if we want to pick. Uh, uh, if we want to pick an optimal slate. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got it. Let me throw away this keyboard and so I don't keep clicking on it. So we've, we've tackled this problem. We've tried to find a sound decomposition of, of, the, of, the, the, of a slate's long-term value, in particular its Q value, into some, into some itemized Q values. And I put the, the itemized here, these Q values for items in scare quotes. In fact, what we're going to learn is a funny kind of Q function, which I call a conditional on click itemized Q value. And the Q value of a slate can be computed directly from and derived from these item level Q values. And the, from a learning perspective, the Q value of a slate will feed into our estimate of these item level Q values. Uh, and in order to make this work, we just have to make a couple of fairly innocuous assumptions about how users are making choices and how it plays with the dynamics of the system. All right, so I'm gonna make two assumptions to allow this decomposition to work, right? The first is that we're going to assume that when presented with the slate, a user selects only one item from the slate, not multiple items, but that can include a null item that, that captures the idea of not making a choice, right? Just not choosing any, any of the other items on the slate. Um, uh, this is, again, not a problematic assumption because even if a user selects an item and goes back to the same slate, we typically characterize that as, as a new event or the user being in a new state when they go back and visit that slate. Another assumption that's maybe a little more of an approximation is that the, the user reward and the state transition depend only on the selected item and not on the other items on the slate. So if they select item I here, the reward depends on the user state and only item I and it's independent of anything else on the state. And the same thing with their state transition. Now, this may not be true in, in reality. It could be that the impressions on the, uh, of the unselected items on the slate have an impact on how a user will make choices in the future, but it's not a bad approximation. Uh, so we're, we're, going to, we're, we're, we're going to use that assumption, okay? Those two assumptions in and of themselves actually allow a very simple but full decomposition of Q values. So here what I've written is just kind of the standard Bellman backup uh, for, for a Q function where L is a slate of items. So those are, those are actions. Right? Just, uh, and it turns out that that can be decomposed in a fairly straightforward way. Basically, this is the expected the, the expected value where we're taking expectations with respect to the probability of a user selecting a specific item of the long-term value of an item I conditional on the fact that it's been clicked, that the user actually selected that item. So that's what this Q bar function is. And the definition of Q bar is, is fairly straightforward. It's just a rewriting of the, of, the, um, uh, of the Bellman backup. But of course, notice that this Q bar depends on the value of the future slates that we might want to recommend. Uh, so two things to notice. First of all, the definition of this Q bar function, it's not a standard Q function, but it, it kind of feels like a Q function because it is a long-term value of an item I. And notice that the Q, the, the Q function itself has a user choice model baked into its formulation. Okay, so uh, sometimes we'll call this a PCTR model. But notice that under this decomposition, uh, notice under this decomposition, it suffices simply to learn these itemized Q bar values. We don't have to learn Q, Q functions over slate because those can be computed directly from the Q bar, uh, from the Q bar functions. So in principle, 
this basically resolves any issue of exploration and generalization. We only have to e explore over individual items and generalize over individual items in the, in the uh, action space. Okay? But it does leave uh, the, the, the optimization problem, right? So notice that if we want to learn these Q bar functions, embedded in it is this combinatorial optimization problem where we have to, at, the, at, at a future state from an RL perspective, find the, the optimal slate, the optimal action to take at that slate in order to back up the optimal values. And we still have this combinatorial optimization problem. Okay. Um, however, it turns out this is actually a fairly, uh, fairly tractable problem. So it's pretty straightforward to formulate this as a fractional mixed integer program. It does depend on the, on the user choice model, but if we have a placket loose or a, or a multinomial logic model, this all carries through. In some sense, you can actually think of this, it, it's kind of a simplified form of what in management science is known as a product line or assortment optimization problem. Uh, it turns out from that literature, we know that we can relax the, 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 the uh, integral part of this to give ourselves a fractional uh, linear program, a non integer linear program, uh, whose optimal solutions are the same. And then we can rely on an old transformation from the 60s, known as the Carnes Cooper transformation, to turn this fractional LP into, an, into a pure LP, right? And I don't worry about the details, but I just formulated the LP here, which shows that this, op this optimization problem is actually, uh, is actually tractable, okay? Um, it turns out, though, if you don't want to go the linear program route, there are other heuristics you can use. You can, you can use a kind of a top K heuristic where you score the individual items by their Q bar values and just weight them by, their, by the user values and put the top K items on the slate. Or you can have a more subtle greedy algorithm where you put an item on the slate, recompute the selection probabilities and so on. These are work well in practice, but they don't have quality guarantees. For example, on the top K method you can show actually has an unbounded approximation ratio, um, but they, they do work well in practice. So we've conducted a bunch of experiments uh, just in the interest of time, because I do want to focus a little more on ecosystems. Um, uh, I won't talk about all the experiments that we did. I'll refer you to our paper. We did a lot of synthetic experiments where we tested scalability and the performance of themselves as, as items. Um, recall that the user choice model is embedded in the learning algorithm itself. Uh, but we can show that this method tends to be fairly robust to the misspecification of the user choice model. So if you train using one user choice model, but users actually make choices differently when you deploy the policy, still tends to do a, a very good job. And all of these things we show provide advantages over being, being myopic. I um, also want to point out that uh, uh, an open source recommender simulation platform that we released uh, at the end of 2019 um, a new version is coming out. In fact, it's just been po posted to GitHub. Still needs a, 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 the white paper to be attached to it called Rexim. Um, I encourage you to take a look uh, if, if you want if, if you want to do simulation experiments with recommender systems. It gives you a very configurable, uh, very configurable platform. But the experiment I want to focus on is one that we did with uh, with the YouTube team on the YouTube homepage. In particular, we took this this specific approach and we added this RL component. Uh, where uh, using this decomposition where we try to predict the, what I'll call these Q bar values of the individual items and use that to formulate slates of recommendations. And we compared this RL approach. By the way, this was critical. There's no way we could scale if we didn't and, and generalize if we didn't have these itemized Q values. Uh, and then we use that to compute optimal slates. And we compared that to the, to the production system using a particular engagement metric that I, won't, that, I, that, I, that I won't disclose, but we're optimizing for a specific engagement uh, uh, metric. And over a course of three weeks, what we see is that uh, some fairly statistic, some non-trivial and statistically significant gains that basically acting non-myopically using RL provided over the myopic uh, recommender system. So what we see is convergence to about a, a 1% improvement in this engagement metric, which is, actually pretty significant for a, for a platform uh, like YouTube, okay? Um, by the way, should I, I, I see that I see a little green dot. So if, uh, if there are any questions that people have or clarifications, uh, I can, let me take a look. I, I don't see any, any questions uh, at the moment, but somebody is now asking something. Okay, situation of reduced view and places, High probability one will be chosen. 
reasonable chance of none being chosen. Um, so not to get into a lot of depth, um, our approach doesn't, in some sense, doesn't really need to distinguish between those, uh, between those situations. Um, if there's a high propensity, if there's a high propensity for the users to choose the null item, like not make a choice, that'll just be folded in uh, uh, into the long-term optimization as you're computing the values of, of slates. So if that didn't answer your question, I can, uh, happy to, to, to elaborate more at the end. So, all right. Um, so in some sense, we, you know, we're very encouraged by this. Uh, it really suggests that even in this relatively, um, uh, relatively, I'll call it a constrained setting. It, it's, it's a very challenging setting, but it still is kind of the standard, let's put some items in front of the user and see how they respond type of classic recommender. Uh, it really shows that there is value to thinking about sequential or long-term optimization and using reinforcement learning. In some sense, what this showed is that, you know, we, we tackled one of the challenges associated with applying our alpha recommender systems. It's just one of the scaling challenges. Uh, so it handled, you know, massive numbers of users and items and dealt with the combinatorics of slates. But there are a number of other challenges that, that arise when we're thinking about applying our alpha recommenders. Um, I've listed a number of them here. I won't go over them all. One that we were spending a lot of time thinking about is user, uh, user latent state. The fact is that the state that we're dealing with is kind of the state of the user, which is you know kind of their mental state. Are they satisfied, unsatisfied? What are they interested in? Uh, what context are they in right now? What activity are they engaged in? Who are they with? And, and so on. There are huge numbers of exogenous factors that will influence a user response. And many of these are simply not observable. If I didn't click on an item, is it because I didn't like it? Or is it because somebody rang my doorbell? We don't know. Right. When you put all this together, we really have some very challenging long horizon, low signal to noise ratio, partial, partially observable MDPs, RL problems. And it's something I don't think as a community we really know how to solve very well. Right? So it's something that we're very concerned about. But finally, let me, let me turn to ecosystems and, and the multi-agent side of things. One of the biggest challenges facing the deployment of, of, of RL is accounting for these multi-agent or ecosystem effects. And what I want to try to convince you is that if we ignore multi-agent interactions, that it's going to have a negative impact on our ability to optimize long-term user utility. Uh, so, you know, I think it should be fairly, uh, fairly clear as we've talked about, well, you know, traditional recommender systems are myopic. They're trying to make, make that best, best immediate match without worrying so much about the long-term impact on users, at least not optimizing for that directly. But they're also local. When I make a recommendation for one user, I'm ignoring what impact that might have on other users or other participants in the, in the recommender platform. And it should be clear, recommender systems actually lie at the heart of a very complex ecosystem consisting of, you know, multiple users, maybe millions or billions of users, providers, uh, you know, many providers of the content that's being recommended or content creators or the vendors of products and services that are being recommended. The platform itself is, a, is, a, is an entity, an agent that's acting in, uh, that's acting in the recommender system. There may be other platforms and other recommender agents that are in maybe a competitive situation. And each of these actors has their own incentives for participating with the recommender system, incentives that are basically going to drive their behavior over time. And it turns out that the recommender system policy will actually couple the behaviors of these individual actors in very interesting ways, causing certain interactions that induce what I think are very interesting dynamics to emerge over time. We think about things like machine and ML fairness. Some of the some of the artifacts are getting attention in the research community these days are in part due to the fact that this is an ecosystem. We have rich get richer effects, filter bubbles, and name name your own phenomena. Lots of really interesting, really interesting dynamics emerge in recommender ecosystems. I want to talk about one specific form, of, one specific type of dynamics that actually impacts the long-term optimization, long optimization question. Um, and that is content provider dynamics. So uh, I'm gonna make a really simple assumption. Let's assume that every provider, obviously every content provider has some incentive to participate with the recommender system, it might be an economic incentive, a social incentive, 
we're going to boil it all down into a simple assumption. We're going to take a, some fixed horizon and we're going to assume that every provider has some minimum level of user engagement that they require in order to continue to engage with the recommender, right? If they don't receive that engagement, they say it's not going to be worth, not going to be worth my while. So then they can, they'll abandon the platform. They can walk away and we'll no longer be able to recommend their content. But if we give them that minimum level of engagement that they require, that will, they'll, they'll continue to engage. Right, very simple model, the simplest possible model of content provider behavior and incentives that, that you can think of. Turns out that even just this really simple model has some interesting consequences. In fact, if we ignore it, if we continue, if we persist in kind of local myopic recommendations, this actually has a, and ignore the, this provider dynamic, it can have a long-term impact on the ecosystem health and, and the, the, uh, the viability and, and the welfare of the providers themselves. And just as critically, it can drive this dynamical system into a very poor equilibrium, even if our only objective is to maximize user satisfaction and not necessarily provider viability, ignoring that can be very bad for users. And let me demonstrate with just a really simple cartoonish example to make this uh, a little more concrete. So let's imagine that all of it's a content recommender system. All of the content can be categorized in some embedding space that you know everything could be corresponded to some mixture of topics, for example. Okay, so um, let's suppose that we've got two providers: the red provider and the blue provider. They are also you know embedded in topic space. Uh, this basically is a, is a representation of the type of content that they provide, and then we've got a bunch of gray circles representing users that that, that represent you know, what is, their, what is their general preference for types of content? And so a user's affinity with the content of a, of a particular provider is just gonna be inversely proportional to their distance to that provider. Okay. So if we think about kind of a standard myopic recommender system, what we would do is every, every user that we shaded in red would be matched to the red provider because that's the closest, the blue users would be matched to the blue provider and away we would go. But now let's imagine that each one of these providers, say, requires six users, that's their kind of minimum threshold of engagement that they need, in order to continue to offer their content for recommendation. Well, in this case, what will happen is this blue provider says, I'm not getting the engagement that I need. So they're just going to walk away, pick up their toys and go home, and we can no longer recommend their content. They're all going to be left in a situation where these users that really like the blue content more than the red content, we have no choice but to recommend the red content to them. Right, So that blue community, I'll call it a niche community because they're a little bit smaller, they're now much worse off uh, after the blue provider left, which was a consequence of this myopic local policy that we, that, uh, that, that we generate. Right? There's a different approach that we could take, however. Right? Suppose that our, our recommendation policy was aware of the fact that these providers might actually, might actually leave if they don't receive sufficient engagement. Uh, a different policy might say, well, let's take these two users that we assigned to the red content the, in, the, in, the, in the original policy, and we instead assign them to the blue, the blue content. Notice that they're pretty much indifferent between the, the, they have a slight preference for red, but they're also okay with the blue content. What we see is that this is enough to keep the blue provider engaged with the platform. So immediately we end up in an equilibrium of this dynamical system. If we continue to make recommendations along these lines, it's stable. Now notice that this is a little bit worse for the, for the users that are kind of at the periphery on the border between these two communities, if you will. Um, but overall, we get much greater user utility, much greater social welfare. Most of the red users are equally, uh, equally well off and the blue users are much better off in this equilibrium than we were in the first one. Okay? We might argue that this is even a fairer allocation in some sense. And by the way, you might say, well, this, is, this doesn't seem very fair to these two users at the periphery, but there are things that you can do, for instance, by randomizing these, they, this policy so that you kind of share the load in, in some sense, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So, uh, okay, it's a little bit slow. Okay, so here's just another demonstration of this. Uh, again, this is using the Rexin platform that I, uh, uh, that I mentioned. Here, what we're showing is, are, uh, is a simulation where the red dots correspond to providers, the blue dots correspond to users, arrayed in kind of topic space here. 
And the size of the dots as we go dynamically will represent kind of some discounted notion of, of the, the user or the provider's current engagement or their current satisfaction, right? And what we'll see as we let this thing, uh, as, we'll let, as we'll let this thing run is that uh, if, if we focus, where are, there, where are the spotlights here? Oh, here they come, okay. So you notice that you know, up at these kind of peripheral communities, what you see is that these red providers, that these dots are shrinking because their engagement gradually over time uh, gets smaller and smaller and, and smaller, and they, they, they eventually will disappear from the system and stop recommending their content. This is a smoother version of that cartoonish example that I gave. And we see that the users in those communities are becoming less and less satisfied with the content that we're forced to, um, forced to recommend to them. Okay. Oh, this, uh... Anyway, I, I think you get the point. I, I think the, uh, it stalled a little bit here. So. There's a quick okay. uh, clarification question, I think, in the chat, uh, Craig. Oh, yeah. Let's see here. Clarification. Okay. Prefer yeah, so uh, I'll talk about the formal model, uh, Amy. So we are assuming that user preferences are static. Uh, we know that that's not the case. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that uh, uh, how you might account for that. But the actual model that we're looking at, we're really just focused on the content provider dynamics. For simplicity, we're, we're assuming that things are, uh, we're, we're assuming that things are, their, their preferences are static. Uh, static, and I shouldn't say static, they're stationary. We're, we'll see the formal model. Users actually can issue different queries. They're not always looking for the same piece of content. Okay, just to be clear. Okay. All right, uh, let's go back here. Oops, let's see, next, oops, okay, hang on. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag, I apologize for that. Um, so here, I'm just gonna show the same animation, I don't think it has the highlights, but this is the non-myopic recommender, the one that is actually aware of the, of the incentives of the individual providers and makes its recommendation in a way that's sensitive to that. I apologize, I don't have the spotlight. But if you'll notice here, the, this recommendation policy actually keeps the, these providers that were out in the periphery that gradually started to disappear, uh, increases their engagement, uh, increases the satisfaction of the users that are part of that community, um, and overall increases uh, uh, social welfare pretty dramatically, pretty significantly, okay? Okay, so, uh, sorry, there we go. Get back, back on track here. Okay, so how do we actually formulate and solve this kind of non-myopic ecosystem aware uh, recommendation problem, okay? So what we're gonna do is formulate it holistically as an optimal matching problem. Essentially, we're going to match query user queries to providers in a way that maximizes user social welfare over an extended horizon, but we're gonna do so in a way that accounts for provider viability, the, these incentives that they have to potentially abandon the system. And we're gonna see that the result is going to be a socially optimal equilibrium of the induced dynamical system. Now I will say for this, for this group, we've talked about it and actually done some work to formulate this actually as a complicated RL problem. It has a massive state space and massive action space because you're thinking about the assignment of content to this huge population of user, users. But in some sense, this, this matching formulation is kind of anticipating the equilibrium that an RL formulation would, would derive anyway and encoding that directly in the optimization problem. Um, so it allows us to generate policies, at least under certain assumptions, that in a way that's much more tractable in trying to solve the RL problem. Okay? So let me really quickly blast through the, blast through the model um, just kind of at a high level. right? So it's going to be a very simple, discrete time stochastic process. Um, at every point in time, we're going to randomly sample a user. A uh, user will randomly uh, occur, uh, will be chosen at each point in time, depending on their propensity. That user will issue a query that's related in a stochastic fashion to their context. So to your point, Amy, the users aren't always looking for the same piece of content, but the queries that they issue is, uh, uh, pertain to some variability related to their overall preferences. The recommender system will then match that query to the content offered by a particular provider, 
then the user will receive a reward based on the affinity of the, the content that they match to, to, their, to their query. And the provider will get some notion of engagement, like, you know, is it how many users did, you know, did, did I get a new user? How, mu how much did the user engage and so on? And then we'll repeat this over time. Okay? And we'll do this for, we're gonna start by assuming we've got some fixed horizon of, of, of length T where, uh, over which this, uh, this um, dynamics will proceed, right? So now what we wanna do is try to find a policy that matches the queries of a particular user to a particular content provider. We'll call this policy C, okay? Now, a couple of other things that we do to make the analysis a little tractable. First of all, we don't want to just sum in some rewards, right? Because of the complexity of user preferences, we want user utility to potentially be a more complex function of the realized reward sequence that they receive. So we're gonna take a snapshot of that, of that sequence over horizon T and then, oops, and then uh, potentially plug it into some arbitrary function. It could just be the sum of rewards. We could have uh, sort of a more sigmoidal, uh, sigmoidal function or just something that, that shows diminishing returns. Once I've, once I've gotten a lot of good content, give me a little more extra good time content is probably uh, probably less important as, as my as my utility function saturates. Okay. The second thing that we'll do is again just assume there's a, cr a creator viability threshold. Each creator has their own their own threshold, and at the end of the uh, of this t steps of this process, they're going to look at their cumulative engagement. For instance, the number of users or the total amount of user engagement with their content, and they'll make a decision: Do I do I do I persist for the for the uh, with the recommender, or do I walk away? Um, and finally, we're going to arrange this in, uh, the, the dynamics over an infinite sequence of these length t epochs, where uh, we have this dynamics. At the end of the epoch, we're going to look at, we're going to apply this utility function to the user realized sequence of rewards, evaluate user utility. The providers will at that point estimate their, uh, you know, assess their viability and decide to leave or abandon. And then we'll repeat that process ad infinitum. Um, now, in the interest of time, I, I don't think I have time to go over, over the, this uh, example. But how do we want to solve this matching optimization problem? Well, just kind of informally, we're going to start by not worrying about the infinite horizon, but just thinking about a per-epic matching optimization over this horizon of length t. Um, and what we want to do is find a stationary stochastic policy or fixed rate policy um, of this form. It basically says for, uh, for any query Q that comes from a user U, what fraction or with what probability do I assign that, that query to a particular creator C, okay? And then our optimization problem is basically gonna be, let's find this policy, this stationary stochastic policy that, uh, that maximizes the sum of user utility, uh, user expected utility conditioned on this policy, where again, user utility is not necessarily just the sum of the rewards, but we can apply that uh, apply some nonlinear function to it, okay? Um, but we're gonna throw this constraint into the problem, right? We're going to insist that uh, we match a query to a provider with probability greater than zero only if the expected engagement under that policy for that particular provider exceeds their threshold. In other words, if the policy is not matching a provider with in expectation to enough of these queries to meet its expected engagement threshold, it will not match to that provider at all, right? So either you have to have enough to keep you viable or you don't get anything, okay? Now, the nice thing about this formulation, forget about how we, we do that optimization, if we take that stationary policy and we now apply it at every one of these epochs over the infinite horizon, we end up, we, we have the, 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 the following properties. First of all, under certain assumptions that I won't get into that relate to the kind of the variance of the um, uh, the variance of the the query distribution relative to the epic length, um, this policy will induce an immediate equilibrium almost by construction. So at the end of the first epic, if we've got a set V of providers that remain viable at the end of the first epic, they will remain viable at all epics over the infinite horizon. Right. So if if you stayed viable you remain viable forever, right? So we induce an immediate equilibrium. Okay? So if we match you, you're good, you're good forever, right? The second thing is, again, just by construction, this policy maximizes long run average user social welfare because subject to that constraint, that equilibrium constraint, 
uh, we, we've opted, we, we, we found the policy that maximizes user social welfare on a per epic basis. Okay. Um, now the question is how do you solve this matching optimization problem? Uh, oh, sorry, I see we're, we're quickly running out of time. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this uh, really briefly. Um, it can be expressed as a mixed integer program. Uh, obviously, this is not necessarily going to be fairly tractable. It depends on the, the, the user utility model under the discounted or additive model. This, this works out quite nicely. Uh, the, this MIP formulation is actually related to various types of facility loca location problems. But you can actually solve this. Don't worry about the details. But if you solve the relaxed LP right, and use simple rounding scheme, you actually get very good results, in it, and, it, and it's very fast. Um, but you can also tackle this problem a little bit differently by thinking, by coming up with kind of a submodular formulation. I won't go into the details, but there is a there is a set optimiz there's a, a set function that basically says what is the maximum welfare that I user welfare that I can get if I insist that a particular fixed set of, of content providers remains viable, right? Assuming that's feasible, we'll call this the 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 max constrained social welfare problem. And if you fix that provider set C, this can be solved as an LP. Um, and then there's a greedy algorithm where you, you kind of one at a time add new providers to the allocation, right? Insist that they remain, insist that everybody in the set is viable. You do it until adding many new providers is infeasible. And this has the right submodularity properties that gives you the, the, the usual approximation guarantees, okay? It turns out, however, that the LP, LP with rounding does as well or usually quite usually better than the submodular optimization right it just doesn't have the guarantees okay uh, i will say the nice thing one nice thing about this matching optimization formulation formulation it's easy to incorporate all kinds of other constraints in it group fairness constraints um, we can put constraints on individual user regret notice that we're sacrificing the utility of some users to improve overall social welfare but we can put bounds or constraints on how much of that we actually uh, on how much of that we actually allow, okay? Um, so we did some tests, some, some synthetic tests. We also did some, some, uh, some uh, tests on, on movie lens data and on Twitter snap data uh, that I won't show. But what we basically wanted to do was compare the performance of this non-myopic ecosystem aware uh, uh, formulation optimization problem. Here, just using the LP rounding scheme because it actually performs better than the submodular formulation. Um, and we wanted to compare it to kind of the standard myopic local ecosystem unaware recommendation policy. And uh, I won't go into the, the, the details, but um, the, the, the ecosystem aware policies uh, improve average user social welfare quite significantly. And even though this is not what we're trying to optimize, it's not part of the objective, it does just as a by byproduct actually keep more of the content providers viable and alive in the recommender system, um, which isn't too surprising, but we just want to make clear that we're not actually trying to optimize for the providers. It's only a byproduct of trying to keep users uh, more satisfied and improve their social welfare. And I will point out that the, the improvement is more pronounced when we have what we call more realistic or skewed preferences rather than uniform you know, interests arrayed in topic space when these are skewed and arranged in kind of communities that we tend to see in practice, this type of approach actually provides much greater benefits than in, in truly random problems, right? Just as interesting is not just the fact that we improve average user, average user utility. We, I mean, by definition, we're gonna do that because that's what we're maximizing. But if we look at the distribution of user utility, um, it changes in a pretty interesting way as well. What we see when we look at the histogram of user utilities under both schemes and in a particular class of problem instances. The green is showing user utility in the, under the myopic policy. The purple is under the, uh, the non-myopic ecosystem aware policy. What we see is that we've shifted it dramatically to the right. So we're improving the number, greatly the number of users that are getting much greater utility, okay, by getting rid of this green, the, this green region, increasing this purple region up here, and we're paying a small price uh, at, the, at the very upper limits, right? So there are going to be some users that were really well off under the myopic policy that end up being slightly less well off under the ecosystem aware policy. But you could argue that this is maybe a much more fair way of, of approaching the problem. 
Okay. Um, sorry, I apologize. I think we're we're uh, we're a little long on time. Um, maybe I can stop there. I've got a number of remarks. I'm I'm happy to stay online if people if people have time. Um, number of interesting questions. I think if we take this recommenders this market design mechanism design or ecosystem view of recommender systems, it 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 begs for treatment in terms of market or mechanism design, right? Because we've got a bunch of interacting agents that each have their own incentives for for engaging with the uh, for engaging with the, the system uh bringing mechanisms to the design to this problem i think can be incredibly valuable i think it bring a lot of benefits but it, it, it it's going to be really challenging from a from a research perspective because the application of mechanism design i'm going to argue I, I will argue if we have time or in discussion that has to be very non-standard but I think that's really interesting as well because it means for people like us, there are great research opportunities here. So, um, so let me let me just leave it there and see if there are any 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 questions. I apologize for going a little uh, a little long, but uh, I can stay for as long as you guys uh, want to discuss questions. No worries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm certain uh, I'm clapping for everyone uh, when I say so. Very interesting talk. Uh, I, I did indeed already see uh, a couple of questions uh, sure. on the chat. I think uh, Louis Blackburn uh, is, 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 is the first question that wasn't picked up, if I'm correct. Oh, yeah. Okay. So maybe I can... I can I can read it out or if... Is, is I, Louis... I, I can see them here. Do you... uh, so yeah, you... I, I can read it out. That's easier. Um... Oh, please, go go for it. Yeah, okay, so um, I was wondering, so since you're attempting to maximize social uh, utility value, I was wondering if there's a weighting according to uh, attempting to optimize that value for the um, for the uh, content creator as well. So if, say, uh, you, so if, uh, so if there's a choice between giving X amount of value to a content creator who ultimately results in higher utility for users versus just straight up generating more value for a content producer who not doesn't necessarily uh, increase the value for other users. Uh, how, is there a way of deciding between which um, between which recommendation you make? Like how how does the optimization absolutely uh, so if, that? If, you, if you wanted if you wanted to put the objective um, some notion of let me say so I'm not going to cast this in terms of fairness like for user, but I do think it brings a different lens to how we should be thinking about fairness. Um, but we can do the same thing from the creator uh, from the creator side. So in fact, we had a paper, there, there, was, a, there was a brief mention, kind of a, a, kind of a side citation there, um, where we've looked at this problem from a reinforcement learning perspective, and it explicitly included the idea of trying to be a little bit fair in terms of the allocation, let's call it the allocation of user attention to different content providers, right? And so there are trade-offs between, hey, you know, can I, should I be fair to the content providers and make, you know, you know induce equal engagement to, uh, across all of those providers, which is presumably going to sacrifice a little bit of user utility, but it's very easy to encode in this, in, in this optimization, right? So if you wanted to include a term that, that, that captured you know the maybe the the, uh, the the you know cumulative user engagement uh, across uh, different providers, possibly weighted by um, you know weighted by various discrepancies and put fairness constraints there. Pretty easy to encode in that optimization, right? But I think one of the points that we want to get across is that even if you're focused on users, you have to worry about the content providers. Yeah. Cool. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, he just left and then before I got a chance to answer a question. So, uh. so, so sorry, uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, not certain Amy had a question, but uh, she, she might have uh, needed to run out. Is that the case? Yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah. It's I just saw a question, I think. So may, maybe we can still tackle it. Yeah, it might course. still be interesting. And if she's really motivated, she can look it back on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so okay, so I think I, I think hopefully I talked about the, you know the the issue of in part the issue of non-dynamic uh, of, of static versus dynamic user preferences. Ultimately, 
this is a very simplified model, but it has some really interesting consequences. Uh, what we're ultimately interested in though is, you know, here we're making this full knowledge assumption. We know what, exactly what a user's preferences are and that they're stationary. They induce a distribution over queries or the content that they might like. There are several things that, uh, that, that we've got at the top of our research agenda. One is extending this model to deal with exploration, right? So we never know what a user's preferences are, right? So we need banded algorithms, preference elicitation algorithms, where we engage with users to try to pinpoint exactly what are they looking for? What is the distribution over the things that they're, they're looking for? Uh, the, the, integrating that into this type of model is pretty critical. The second thing just related to Amy's first question is, uh, but aren't user preferences non-stationary? Yes, they're absolutely dynamic. There's no doubt, I mean, I'd like to take kind of a behavioral economics perspective. The, the things that we recommend to users are no doubt influencing their preferences. We kind of take the preference, the, 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 the view of this in terms of preference construction from behavioral economics. People don't have preferences fully formed in their heads. We're, we're influencing them. And the dynamics of their preferences are clearly going to be shaped by the recommendations that we make. That's one of the reasons that we see for instance, filter bubbles and, and, and things along those lines. Um, so that's also a, a factor that we're incorporating into some of, our, some of these models for, from the perspective of future, uh, future research, right? So, um, yeah. So that was the static, the, the, the static preference question. Um, do you want me to just scroll through the chat? In, yeah, so, in... so perhaps actually, uh, perhaps I can tag on a little bit on the answer oh, yeah. that you, you, you gave there. Because uh, uh, you mentioned these 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 uh, uh, filter bubbles, and actually, to some extent, the uh, equilibrium approach that you were advocating triggered my, uh, my thoughts to this as well, right? Because it seems that by indeed keeping these, these content providers uh, in place, in a sense, you're also then perhaps keeping people somehow trapped in their in their own bubbles. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, so there are two ways there there are two ways of, uh, of of thinking about that. Right. One is, um, uh, sorry, I, I'm trying to trying to think about the best way to sequence this. Um, so the, 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 this model, in some sense, is kind of inherently static with respect to uh, with, with respect to users, right? Um, and it's assuming that kind of user utility or user affinity is is the static thing that we don't try to influence, right? Um, let me just pop ahead to one slide here. Uh, oops, right. Oops, da, 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 da. Yeah, so I think this is going to get to, in, in part, to your question, Franz. Uh, if we view this as kind of a mechanism design problem, then we re you, you can't do that without articulating a social choice function, right? A function that basically says, um, as a function of every individual, indiv individual agent's preferences, what is the social welfare that we generate? Uh, what is the social welfare associated with any particular outcome, right? And I take social welfare, you know, in, in the classic sense, to be an arbitrary function relating the preferences and the outcome space to some 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 real valued welfare, right? Here, what we've done, what we've optimized was just user utility, right? We could easily throw in other cons you know other factors like provider utility. Uh, but of course, when we talk about societal dynamics, that's why I mentioned things like diversity of user content consumption, the emergence of filter bubbles, the notion that preferences may evolve and, and so on. If we think from a social perspective, this is both an opportunity and a, and a challenge and something very controversial. If we think that there are properties of user consumption that are good or bad, Right. Or if we take kind of a behavioral perspective and say, you know, user utility is not really just the sum of these individual affinities. Maybe users actually derive utility in a way that they don't uh, they don't currently have the ability to express from uh, from 
a diverse set of content, right? So that's why I focused on consumption stream. Yes, I love this content, right? But I don't want to only see that content. Incorporating that in the user utility function or in the social choice function, independent of the user utility function, will exactly address that type of uh, that type of problem, right? But it's more taking a, a holistic view on, of, of of a social choice function, which I think is one of the values that mechanism design can bring to this whole enterprise. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But so, so, so then, in order to deal with these uh, 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 um, uh, more um, more complex uh, uh, social choice functions or uh, use, user preferences, um, that I, I guess that then means that the approach that you're now taking also needs to be adapted to uh, oh, yeah, yeah, incorporate yeah. that, right? Because this is now it seems kind of based on those fixed points oh, yeah. moving around Absolutely. right so think of this formal model that i presented as kind of a first step yeah, down, yeah. down this path that basically it basically is intended to convince that ignoring these ecosystem effects is bad uh but i'll be the first to to say that a, a lot of these assumptions is a very stylized model and unrealistic in many respects the 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 problems are only going to be more pronounced when we make these models uh, more realistic. Yeah, yeah, I um, get the point. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so so indeed, let, let, let's see if there were any other questions that, uh, uh, yeah, actually there have been quite, quite a few questions still, I think. Uh, okay, I think we talked, I think we kind of talked about Lewis's question. Uh, yeah. yeah. And Amy's next question. Oh, in terms of sigmoidal, uh, yeah, I won't give a, a, a. I'll refer to our paper, right? So there's a there, in the slide deck. There'll be a pointer to the to the ICML paper um, for the for the simple discounted decreasing returns that can be formulated within the MIP that I uh, the MIP that I described. If we actually have a sigmoidal utility function, uh, you, you have to rethink the MIP formulation. So you the way we do it, it's it's what's sometimes called kind of a star formulation in facility location where the 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 instead of thinking about assignment variables the vari the variables in the MIP are the actual assignments themselves right so it's a huge massive explosion of the number of decision variables and then the way that we handle that is using column generation right so it's kind of a pretty classic OR technique so we basically get rid of that that hard to deal with nonlinearity. Discounting is pretty easy to deal with, but sigmoidal nonlinearity is hard to encode in a in a mixed integer linear program. So we basically uh, basically uh, wish it away by transforming the problem into uh, into um, uh, in, into a decision space that that basically enumerates all possible assignments. So if you give me a, a fixed assignment, then it's just a it's just a, a constant sigmoidal uh, utility, it just, it's basically just a, a, a bunch of constant terms that are used to compute the utility of a fixed assignment. And then we use column generation to solve that. All right. Yeah, should we uh, uh, pick up one or two more questions? Uh, or yeah, I, I don't know when you will need to run off yourself also, Greg. I, 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 I can say if you guys have a, a you know a few more minutes. Why, why don't why don't if friends you're looking at these questions? Why don't you suggest one or two? Yeah, so here uh, is one by uh, Michael Hoons. Uh, I'm not certain if he's still around. If so, he can post it himself. Otherwise, I can read it out. Um, yeah, I'm still here. Basically, I was just wondering if uh, you could. Uh, reduce the complexity of the system by introducing some knowledge level guidance. For example, uh, uh, you could eliminate all old news shows from consideration uh, for recommendations, because mm -hmm. no one wants to watch uh, old news or things they've seen before. Yep. But they might want to uh, listen to favorite songs again and again. Yeah, uh, yeah no, uh, uh, absolutely, right? So recommender systems in practice actually do that kind of thing all the time, right? So there will be features uh, in the model predicting whether, you know, will a user click or not click, uh, depending on whether, for instance, in a content domain, like you were talking about news or music, uh, 
that 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 uh, have features that say, hey, was this content consumed or how recently was this consumed? And that will be folded into these models that are predicting, you know, click rates, engagement rates, other other user behaviors. Um, uh, at the same time, the way these things get uh, the way these things get filtered, you know, typically, you know, I'll I'll, I'll talk about um, say a, a system like YouTube, where you know I think it's it's publicly known that there are that the that the system engages in uh, just at, at an abstract level, kind of a two level process where you know there there's a fast process that takes a huge vocabulary of potential items, and there are a bunch of different ways of generating candidates in the uh, for recommendation, whittling that down, and then the, that smaller number of candidates is put through a much more intensive uh, uh, deep learned model to make predictions about you know user user responses of various various types in order to produce a ranking so um, so a lot of those processes can do exactly the type of filtering and down playing of or up playing if the case may if if, if circumstances warrant previously consumed content for sure But, but again, normally you don't add it as a constraint. You typically want to learn that, right? Like, like you said, in some domains, people may want to listen to the same music. In other domains, they don't want to see the same news, right? So um, there, there are a lot of intricacies there. All right. Hope, hope that answers the question. We'll take that for a yes, I, uh, I think. Um, yeah, perhaps a last question. Uh, I see here's a question also by uh, Stephen uh, McAleer, and I see he's also still around. Yeah, um, so thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, this is great. So in certain markets, such as online labor markets, yeah. uh, agents might be incentivized to misrepresent their preferences. That's right. So broadly speaking, uh, what do you see the path toward combining recommender systems with mechanism design? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so this is something we're thinking. I don't have. I don't. You know. I don't. I don't have the answer to that. Um, but it is. Th this is one of the broad challenges. I'm glad you brought it up. That I think we should be tackling as a community. Right. So I'm a. I'm a big fan of mechanism design conceptually, but I think. Uh, so that's why I put this slide up. Uh, I think when it comes to applying mechanism design to recommender systems, we're going to have to kind of rethink the standard formulations, right? In, so in, from, in mechanism design, we have to make two assumptions. First, the agents are rational. They're trying to optimize their own long-term interests. And second, they're strategic, right? So when I do something, I'm anticipating how others might respond and ultimately trying to anticipate the equilibrium there, right? Now, I think in recommender systems, it's unlikely that users are rational in this full sense. I do think they do an you know they 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 do an okay job in kind of a myopic sense of trying to optimize their own utility. I don't think they're very good at trying to steer or navigate the recommender, you know, to 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 optimize their utility over very long horizons. And there's there's some evidence in the literature that this is the case. Um, you know, if we even think just from a behavioral perspective, just things like hyperbolic discounting, right? You know. Users are, you know, users are very attracted. That's why clickbait exists. It's very easy to attract users to certain type of content, but in the long run, it decreases their satisfaction and will decrease their engagement. If they were tr truly rational, they wouldn't fall. You know, I don't want to say fall, right? But you know, they they'd be less inclined to to uh, uh, to to clickbait in some sense, right? But you know, they're probably at least to some extent thinking about their own interests. But I do think it's exceedingly unlikely that users and recommender systems are thinking strategically, thinking about, oh, if I do this, then, oh, this will be good for, you know, the, the, the system or other users will respond this way or the, the provider of the content that I'm consuming will, will react in a certain way. And there may be some evidence of that. That's why you see, for instance, loyalty to, to specific content providers uh, content creators, channels, and, and things like that. In some sense, that can be viewed as strategic, but I don't think users are that sophisticated. Now, content providers or vendors, if you know, if it's recommendations of products and services, those those types of folks will be 
much more strategic. Again, not clear how fully rational they'll be. Uh, but their information is limited, right? Because they don't have, uh, again, normally in mechanism design, we kind of assume, well, we, we kind of know what the distribution of other agent preferences is and we act in, in that way. And we're kind of seeing what their, their actions are. But even here, content providers, vendors, they have very limited visibility into what's going on in the entire ecosystem. They only get to see what, what's happening with the users that are engaging with them, right? Or the ones that were explicitly had an opportunity to engage with them, but ultimately didn't. They don't really see what all of the other users that didn't engage with them at all, they have no idea what they might have been doing. Um, so there's also a really interesting question as to what types of tools that we can provide to offer visibility to, say, the content providers in a in a recommender system, right? I, I draw an analogy, you know, I'll just take Google as an example. For advertisers, there are these notions of things like bid landscapes. So you, you, they, they do have tools at their disposal. Hey, if I change my bid, I can kind of get a prediction of what's going to happen, what, what, what the effects will, will be from the perspective of what I care about. Can we do the same analogous types of things for content providers, for example? Right. It's a really interesting question. So I, yeah, I always throw it out to the community. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, perhaps we should then uh, try and wrap up. Uh, uh, some people indeed already needed to uh, to run off. Uh, went a little bit over time, but uh, I think other people uh, were very uh, uh, happy uh, also to stick around uh, a bit longer for some of these questions and it's very interesting. Um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, let's let's perhaps wrap up uh, uh, by uh, thanking you again, Greg. Uh, it was really a very interesting and inspiring talk. Thanks very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. So um, feel free to drop me a line if you've got any other questions. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I know this was fairly high level, but I'm really passionate about this the, this topic and, and this this research direction. So, I, hope I, I think one of the, the questions also was on some pointers uh, 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 to 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 useful papers. Uh, if you include this uh, somehow in the last slide, and then we can perhaps upload it on the. On our I'll, I'll do that when I send you the slides. There there are there are probably a few pointers in there, so I'll, I'll just make sure that they and uh, they have some some good back pointers as well. So. Great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Greg. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Noel. Bye.